of uh, electric, it's actually more than three, but this is basic stuff. You have no permanent dipoles. Permanent, if you can read that. You can have no permanent dipoles, but you can induce. You can have, you can have permanent dipoles, but kind of loose. Or, and, and in fact, this is called para-electric. It's sort of like the molecules of water, where they don't have any particular orientation. And then you can have sort of rigidly bound together, uh, oriented, which is the ferroelectric. Now, yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, you're right. You might have to do a different kind of structure. You, um, the, uh, this, this probably would not work, but you would probably get something more like this, and then maybe some space in between. Here, at least, they would like each other. Uh, if you had a good point, then maybe you could do something like this, make the structure a little bit, you know, offset. Typically, the kind of material that ferroelectrics have, um, it's a crystal structure. One of them is barium titanate. It's a complicated structure, and uh, the, uh, I think the titanium ion is offset from wh where the other ions are, so it produces a net dipole, and you can jiggle that titanium around. So what happens is, um, that's a very good question you asked, by the way. Uh, th th this is the electric story. When we get to magnetism, we're going to have a similar story. We're going to have, in magnets, I say this because some of th th this is sort of part of our experience without even reading a book. Uh, we will find that you can, if you have no dipoles, you can induce magnetism in everything. You can induce a certain amount of magnetism in everything. You will have some cases where you have loose dipoles. Now, you've experienced this. Have any of you done nuclear magnetic resonance? Probably all of you. OK. Those are nuclear magnetic resonance. It's sometimes called nuclear paramagnetic resonance. Have you heard the word paramagnetic resonance? No, it's not commonly used. But this is called a paramagnet. Now, what do you think those, when you do an NMR, you're doing the hydrogen uh, is what you're doing nuclear resonance on, right? The hydrogen nuclear resonance. There's the nucleus. It's got a little magnetic moment, right? And then there's a hydrogen someplace else far away that has also. So these are loosely thrown in ma little magnets. They're independent of each other, right? So they, they are this kind of an analog of the hydrogen uh, of, of the water molecules that are loosely associated with each other, having their own little fields. And they all have their own little direction, and they do their own thing. So that is called a paramagnet. And nuclear magnetic resonance is done on these paramagnets, because those nuclei have their actual nuclei with their magnetic moments very far from each other. They, they just are oriented in a magnetic field. They don't see each other very well. You get a little bit of shift, right? You get chemical shifts due to one nuclear moment affecting another, but that's small. Then you have the case, uh, and I'll emphasize this again, where you have self orient the same thing going on, what I call here, permanent alignment. Self or permanent alignment. What happens there, again, if you, you, have these, you have these magnets, actually in this case it's the electrons that are doing the magnetism, nuclei are rather weak, but you get the electron magnets all lined up with each other and we call that a ferromagnet. So there's this beautiful um, symmetry between what electric things do and what magnetic things do. I only bring that up, this part we haven't touched on yet, it's a very nice effect, but it's an an analogous to how you induce an electric polarization by just bringing a charge near it. If you bring a magnet near anything, you will start to induce some magnetism in the thing. Um, and that's an induced magnetic effect. This, if you have little permanent magnets like the nuclei, or little permanent magnets in, 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 a, in hydrogen, or many things, uh, you get these loosely associated magnets. And then you can get the super magnets, <laughs> where you get these electrons. Electrons have very big magnetic moments. And in some materials, like iron, they lock together, and you get this very strong magnetic for, uh, attraction with them. And that's the you know, analogy here. I really wanted you to see that, because the book doesn't make it perfectly clear. Yes? Um, I can get an like OH minus. OH minus? Well, there, I don't know that you have a dipole necessarily. That sounds like a charged object. So it probably acts more like a point charge. You don't have the plus associated with it. That's an ion. So that'll act more, I would say, instead of looking like that, it's a very good question also, uh, I would say that if it's an ion, it's going to act more like a point charge. So if I have OH molecule, uh, fraction with a minus, then that is going to, I don't, the charge is distributed around here. Oh, and that, re that really gets us into how do you treat a blob of charge? And that's where Gauss's law will help us. But basically, from a distance, that's going to look like a single negative charge. And so uh, nearby, it may do funny things. But at a large distance, I think it's going to look like, actually, if it's negative, it's going to see things like this, right? And then what it does right up against the, the molecule, if the molecule is a funny shape, it may do some strange little curly things, but far away, it's going to look like a, like a single point charge. Yes? <coughs> yeah, that's a very good point, too. What we do, if you have two charged objects, let's see, do I have it here? Uh, let's see. So here's the, here's the field of the dipole. OK. Um, let me skip over this to go to your question, the forces on matter. So when you have two charges, the way I look at it, <laughs> this is my slide, so you've probably seen it. I had to make up the word, there's a pusher and a pushy. And you decide who is the pusher, and pushy is my word. We know what pushers are. <laughs> but we don't have pushy, so I guess the guys get pushed. But <laughs> so uh, you decide, if you have two water molecules, it doesn't really matter what you, which you choose, actually, because the forces will be the same on them, because of Newton, Newton's law. Uh, hopefully, we don't even need that. Hopefully, it's charged. Um, yeah, so if you had a dipole, P, and another dipole here, what you would do is you say, one of them I'm going to choose as the source of the field. I want to find the interaction between these. And I would say, this guy is now my pusher. And he has a field. Then I put this fellow in his field, and I see what it does. Now, for example, if the field is like that, what it's going to do, it's going to, put, it's going to attract the negative end and put the positive end that way. Right? So this guy is a pusher, and this is the pusher. He's been pushed, oriented in his field. And you see that this makes sense from, th from this fellow's point of view, too. You could think of him as a pusher creating a field, which would align this guy in, in that way. As this lady said before, the molecules want to align each other in each other's fields. So um, no matter which way you start, you, uh, you come up with the same answer. 
but it's, and the problem will tell you sometimes they will say I have a charge in a field and they won't tell you how they can make that field but if you have two charged objects you say one of them is a source and one of them is acted upon the, the, um, let's leave it at that that's what the is so um, okay now the other thing that the book does not make terribly clear is is this charge that's being acted on in a vacuum or is it in a material that makes a big difference in this chapter we, we write things like there's a field and you put a charge in it there's a force and you have f equals ma and so you, the force is the electric force but that assumes there's no other forces it, so that means that it's in a vacuum because for example um, uh, the, the, the charge could be in a material, in, in a wire, for example. We're going to get to that in a couple of, we in a couple of weeks. Uh, the charge is moving in a wire. In that case, you put on an electric field, the movable charges, the electrons, feel that force. But as they go through the wire, they feel another force going the other way, friction force. So it's very similar to uh, the case of uh, jumping out of an airplane. If, if you're in a vacuum, you'll fall. The only force acting is gravity, and you'll speed up and speed up. And you'll, so you say the gravity force F equals mg will produce ma, um, an acceleration. On the other hand, if you have a parachute, there's another force acting the force of the wind on the parachute. And in fact, you, come, you, you don't accelerate anymore, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, the parachute does its job. You, you speed up and then you slow down and you keep a constant speed because the force of the wind is equal to the force of gravity, so you, you, pick, you don't accelerate anymore and you go to constant speed until you hit the ground, right? So that's, that's like when a charge goes through a wire, it doesn't keep accelerating. It turns out that the wire usually slows it down or stops it from accelerating. So you've got to be a little careful here that when you're doing these problems, be aware that right now we're talking about a vacuum, but don't be surprised, but in a week or so, we're going to be putting electrons through wires and it's a different story. Um, well, let, let me leave that. Oh, now I think maybe I have time enough only for this little story. From what we have so far, uh, and we'll see it again in, in the story on uh, Gauss's law, that I want you to um, do quantitative problems like you do in mass physics. But in your real world, you probably will never do a real cal hard calculation of an electric field in a complicated situation. But on the other hand, I want you to be able to have a feeling for what an electric field looks like so that you could sort of guess how an apparatus works. OK, now we have five minutes. So let me do this. Yeah, I don't have time for this. This will be the Gauss thing. I'll do that next time. Um, but let me do this once now. The, the electric field is actually, uh, these, um, these brushes have figured out electric fields for us. So let me, these are the rules for guessing the electric field. Um, let's see, what are they here? Uh, let me see if I can read it better here. Well, for, first of all, we said that the lines go out of the positive and into the negative. Okay. They superpose as vectors. They cannot cross. And in a sense, they, they sort of repel each other. They spread into any space that they have available. And for example, and this is, this is an interesting case. There's a problem in the book where, which is worked out in, in, in great detail, of a ring of charge. This charge spread uniformly on this ring. And the question is to find the electric field along the axis of this thing. So you have charge here, Q over the thing. Now, the book does it. You do it by integration. You, you, you imagine you have a little piece of charge here. It produces its electric field at this point. But there is a comparable, because this is a circle, there's a comparable charge on the other side of the same magnitude. So it produces an electric field like that. So clearly, uh, the sideways components cancel out, and you end up with a net at that point um, along the axis. And that's true everywhere along here. They, all the sideways ones cancel out, but all the uh, ones along the axis add up from all the different charges until you get a net field in that direction. And if you do the integral of all of these things with the angle, you see you know, E cosine theta integrated over the whole thing, you get an answer. I forget what the answer is, but oh, oh here it is actually here. But I want to show you how you can guess the answer. Now I'll show you the answer here. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, the exact solution is at the bottom. Pretty nasty looking thing. Uh, there's that constant k, the charge on the ring, um, the distance x over x squared plus a squared to the three halves power. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's do it just by simple ways. Let's start with the, let's plot, make a plot of e versus x, just by guessing. What would e be right at the center? It's going to be zero, because you see every charge produces a field here, and this guy produces a field, but this guy produces the opposite one. So everybody cancels out at the center. So at the center, the field is going to be zero. Right? Okay, so. Let's go now to the limit of a very large distance, way far away from this radius. I think the radius is A. Let's go very, very far away, where A looks really small. It looks like a point. So this thing will look like a point charge from a big distance. So from a big distance, it's going to look like a point charge, which goes as 1 over R squared, E does, right? So here you have a thing which starts at 0, and then it goes to 0 at a large distance. So what's it going to do in the middle? It's going to pass through a maximum. And what's a likely place for it to pass through a maximum? Well, there's only one dimension in this problem, A. So let's just guess that at, at a distance about A, it will sort of do something like this and connect up. Now, if you, solve the, if you plot that equation, uh, plot E as a function of x, you'll find something very much like this. The, but the, um, the maximum is not exactly at A, but it's at A over square root of 2, 1.4. So this is, I'm just trying to show you that with a little intuition, you can guess the answers to a, a lot of questions. When it comes to the Gauss thing, um, you will, uh, 
you'll see that it, it helps a great deal to have intuition. Now, for example, the, the field lines follow the symmetry of the object. For example, if the thing is a point, it's got spherical symmetry. Every, every direction looks pretty much the same, so it stands to reason the thing is going to be spherically symmetric. I think I have a better spherically symmetric thingy here, maybe. Ah, right. this is actually a uh, lint remover. Friend gave me this uh, friendly lion. So this is like a point charge, and these are the lines coming out, and the lion's coming out. Oh, that's too good. <laughs> I didn't thought of that. But, um, so, but it's a point charge, and the, 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 the lines radiate radially, because what else can they do? I mean, it's, it's the symmetry of the point. Now, if you have a line of charge, the, 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 the lines go out. They can't, if this is an infinite line, there's no reason for them to lean this way or that way. And, and there's no reason for them to be different in this direction and that direction, but it's only a line. So the lines must look like this on an infinite uh, line of charge. What can't lean this way, any other way. Now, if you have a plane of charge, they shouldn't, there's no reason to lean this way or that way or that way or that way, so they go straight, straight up and down. Except if you're near the edge. If you're near the edge, you have room to go, and then you follow the rule that there's room to kind of lean into the empty space. So you get what's called a fringing effect at the edge. And here is a, uh, an example of where it switches from a line of charge, radial, uh, this way, to a point charge at the end. And so if you were asked to calculate or even imagine when an electric field is in a complicated situation, I think you could just imagine yourself a brush <laughs> um, and how would the bristles go. And it's very s similar. You'll see in the Gauss law that, well, I, I really can't kind of say that, but if, if you draw a, uh, a surface which does not include the source, there are as many bristles going into the surface as come out of the surface. So that tells you there's no source in it. Whereas if you draw a surface which includes the source, there'll be more bristles coming out than coming in. But there's nobody coming, if you draw it this way, there's no bristles coming in. And that tells you there's a source inside. I'll go into that next time, next Monday, so have a good weekend.